one. Please start, sir. We are live. So, very good evening, one and all. Very good evening, fellow doctors. It's a pleasure to invite each and every one of you back again for the second session of the Cardio PG Masterclass. And uh, true to our commitment at McLeod's Pharmaceuticals, uh, the endeavor here is purely to further science, purely to further an exchange of ideas and facilitated learning, especially for the younger budding geniuses in the field who are, go who are going to be leaders of tomorrow. Uh, further on to the same, I have the honor of introducing uh, our esteemed faculty for our Cardio PG Masterclass today. So we have uh, as course directors, Professor Dr. Ajay Mahajan, sir, and Professor Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir. Uh, as per schedule, presentation would be on a synotic congenital heart disease with uh, a keynote presentation further on an approach the same. Uh, here we have uh, our esteemed faculty. Uh, I now would take the honor of briefly introducing our entire audience to you. We have Professor Dr. Ajay Mahajan, sir, who is head of the department of KEM Mumbai. We have Uh, senior intervention cardiologist and Professor Dr. Anita Saxena, who is Vice Chancellor of PDB SUHS Rota Haryana. And finally, uh, New Delhi. Uh, without taking, I hand over the session to uh, our esteemed uh, faculty, Professor Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir. Sharma, sir, over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the second lecture in this series. We have a pleasure uh, to have Dr. Ramakrishnan, Professor Ramakrishnan from uh, Ames, and uh, uh, Professor, and now, ma'am, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Anita Saxana, ma'am, uh, to have this case presentation that we have uh, being presented by Dr. Maulik. Dr. Maulik is second year resident, actually, so he's much ahead. Uh, in terms of presenting instead of third, we wanted him to have an early exposure on presentation. So here, yeah, Dr. Maulik Kalyani is going to present a case of acyanotic congenital heart disease and uh, to uh, chair the session. And also after the case presentation, we will have Dr. Anita Saxena Ma'am present, taking us through the nitty gritties and the expert talk on the same. And uh, for his case presentation, uh, the Viva will be grilled by Dr. Anita Saxena Ma'am and Professor Dr. Ramakrishnan, along with myself and Dr. Ajay Marjan. So over to you, Dr. Maulik, you can start with your presentation and uh, let's join our faculties for the case presentation by Dr. Maulik on SINRT congenital heart disease. Good evening, everyone. So I am presenting the case of uh, 18 months old female child from Patan, Gujarat, informant uh, being mother, presented with chief compliance of failure to thrive since birth and one episode of pneumonia at the age of the one month, with difficulty in feeding and hurried breathing from the age of the one month. So the history of presenting illness, patient was relatively asymptomatic till age of one month, then she developed one episode of cough, cold, fever and respiratory distress, requiring hospitalization for uh, five days and IV antibiotics, oxygen, uh, her mother also noticed poor feeding and breathing difficulty during feeding. At that time, she was diagnosed as congenital heart disease with hole in the heart and advised for close follow-up and surgical correction. Patient was loath to follow up then. After this, patient did not have any similar episode of uh, a lower respiratory tract infection, but patient weight gain is poor and breathing difficulty continued. As per her mother, she is having hurried breathing during feeding and due to that, the repeated small attempts for feedings uh, associated with the poor sleep. And on asking, she is also giving history of perspiration during feeding. Go on, go on, Dr. Molly. Okay. So, it wasn't associated with cyanosis, cyanotic spells, or cutting episodes. Uh, there was no edema, oliguria, or seizure, or any focal neurological deficit. Uh, there is no history of recurrent or of prolonged fever. Uh, antenatal history, there wasn't any history of uh, drug intake in mother. 
uh, noise from smoking, alcohol intake in mother, or diabetes, hypertension, radiation exposure, or fever with rest in mother. So birth history is full term normal vaginal delivery with uh, birth weight 2.7 kg. Uh, baby was cried immediately after birth. Uh, there is no history of prolonged jaundice, seizure, fatigue in neonatal period, and there is no history of NICU stay. Development and history. A uh, physical underdevelopment was uh, noted by parents since six to seven months, uh, but there is no psychosocial delay, and child is vaccinated for age according to national immunization schedule. And uh, this is our uh, pediatric child, single child of nine months, non concerned in marriage. So, the provisional just, diagnosis. Just wait, is just, just wait before you go further. <clears throat> I would like to know what is the age of the baby? Eight months, ma'am. But in here, in the diagram that you're showing, you're saying nine months. Yeah, okay. So I think these kind of things, please don't do it. One month for a baby makes a lot of difference compared yeah. to an adult. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That is number one. Also, you haven't told us, is he the only child they, they have? Yes, ma'am. So it's the first baby. First baby. And this 28 and 25 years is currently the age, I suppose, or it yes, was the age at the time of birth. In the current age. Right. Generally, we talk about, of course, here it's not very different because the child is only eight months, nine months. But generally, we talk about the maternal age, paternal age at the time of birth. Okay. So if you have a you know, 10 year old or 11 year old, it'll be good to say what was the year, what was the age of the mother or age of the father at the time of birth. Right. Okay. Can you summarize your history before you go to the possibilities? Uh, so, the history, patient is having history of. Uh... Uh, there is a, a, I mean, a, a burn episode of the lower respiratory tract infection with a failure to thrive. And uh, there is a, a history suggestive of a typical suck rest suck cycle, uh, which is uh, suggestive of a left to right chunk, uh, uh, large in the nature. So, probably post. Next slide. Go to the next slide. Uh, so, it is the yeah. congenital asynotic, uh, raised the pulmonary blood flow, left to right chunk, post strike speed, and a patient is in CCF with failure to thrive. I think it's it's very hard to be so specific about post tricuspid shunt. It's okay. It looks like a large flow, but you know, if you have some like a TAPVC or a pre tricuspid shunt, cyanosis may be very minimal and may not be noticed by the family, especially when they are very young. You know, uh, saturation of ninety percent, eighty eight percent or so will not be appreciated by mother. So don't be so specific uh, before examination. Keep your options a little wider than saying post tricuspid. CHF, yes, it's possible because the history you are saying is more like a heart failure. And increased pulmonary blood flow, I would agree. But I think that's all you would be able to say. In pre Dr. Malika, there is a left or right front uh, in before, uh, in, uh, three to four. In hey, that's before. okay. But uh, what ma'am is trying to say is some of the pre tricuspid shunt also can present at this age where yes. cyanosis can be subtle. That is what yes. you cannot be vehement about post tricuspid shunt. That's okay. what ma'am is saying. So also, if you have somebody... a, you know, something like an ASD with cold triatriatum, you know, yes, that they'll yes. behave in the similar way. So what I'm saying is keep your options open. Don't be so dogmatic mm -hmm. because you have examined the patient. But right now you are discussing only based on history. You mm -hmm. might have examined, you might have seen echo. So you know the diagnosis. But mm -hmm. when you start your exam, your examination before that, you need to be very, very open as to what it could be. And as I said, you know, ASD cold triatriatum will not be blue also. TAPVC is non-obstructive, can be very minimally blue. And there's, these are not post tricuspid shunts. Sorry, Dr. Rama, go ahead. So, so one in, in your summary, you didn't mention about the onset of symptoms at one year, one month. And you didn't mention about when was the child diagnosed to have a hole in the heart. So these are very important when it comes to any cyanotic congenital heart disease uh, diagnosis in your summary, when you're summarizing. Yeah. What is the importance of symptoms starting at one month, say, some, compared to somebody somebody getting symptomatic at one week of life? What is the importance? Uh, sir, uh, at the most of the left to right shunts are uh, start uh, happening after the four to six weeks of the uh, period because uh, there is a pulmonary vascular resistance which will not be uh, that much. That will allow the large quantity of uh, left to right shunt. While the some uh, cyanotic heart disease and uh, obstructive lesions. Uh, uh, like uh, hypoplastic left heart, etc., we can present in first week of the life. So, uh, so what, what are the what are other conditions? First week of life, you said. Uh, uh, what are the conditions that you said? One is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. You said what else? Uh, sir, uh, severe coagulation of aorta, then uh, obstructive TAPVC, then uh, CCTGA, uh, then uh, sir, uh, any CCTGA? Why, CCTGA? Or... why CCTGA? Uh, 
So remember it like this, shunt lesions are very rare to cause. Yeah. You leave alone cyanotic because we are leaving, looking at acyanotic congenital heart disease that present with heart failure very early yeah. in life. Yeah. So the lesions has to be either obstructive lesions of aortic valve or pulmonary valve or coarctation, something like this, yeah. or something that produces pulmonary venous hypertension, or it has to be regurgitant lesions primarily. Or, so or myocardial please, pathology. Yeah, so yeah, yeah Dr. Rama, yeah, please. So these are the pathologies that generally present with early, very early in life. Okay. So going still back, can you tell me causes of, of failure at birth, Dr. Maulik? And, and then again, I can ask you, still going back, fetal failures. So fetal heart failures, what are the causes of failure at birth? So I think a lot of those causes will be common, what Dr. Ramakrishna has already uh, given you. So what are the causes of fetal heart failure and how do they present? How would a sonologist tell you that this patient is probably having a heart failure on an ultrasound? Uh, sir, LV2 RA stunt is a gerbo defect uh, in fetus. Fetal, fetal, fetal heart failure. Uh, Where would the edema go if the patient was to develop? Because So causes of fetal failure include one, includes one more cause apart from the causes that you mentioned, which is tachyarrhythmias. Yes. Right. So that's one or the other cause that you should remember. Hydrops is the one of the manifestation, of course, yes. that you will find. And fetal uh, cranial translucency is something that usually the uh, associated finding that these uh, sonologists would often tell you that this is what they are looking at, apart from, of course, cardiomegaly or other fetal echocardiographic findings that they may be able to pick it up. There are some more causes. Again, cardiomyopathy is hyperplastic left heart coag, uh, already covered by Dr. Ramakrishnan. So those are the other things that you remember. How? What do you define as failure to thrive? Sir, uh, according to the definition, failure to thrive defined is less than a five percentile in weight for age, uh, height for age, and BMI uh, in less than five percentile of the range. So what is the definition for recurrent respiratory tract infection like? Uh, sir, uh, IAP definition of recurrent uh, respiratory infection is uh, uh, at least uh, two uh, respiratory attack infection require hospitalization in one year or total number of uh, three infections. Is it the same as the Western definition uh, or is, is it different? Or why, if it is different, why do you need different definition for Indian subgroup of patients as compared to the European definition of group of Milano definition that we follow? What is that Caucasian definition or the Western definition of? Sir, um, Western definition, sir, it is uh, around six per uh, year, sir. So they don't look at it in one year. It's in cumulative in terms of two years. And they also count on outpatient basis, which in our part of the world may be very difficult to look at. Because a lot of respiratory tract infections, especially viral, are very common in our subgroup of patients. And that is why IAP has come up with a different definition, which you just described. So you cannot have that kind of an outpatient definition in our part, because half of the children would be very often exposed because of overcrowding, hygiene, etc., to upper respiratory tract infection that may be very frequent. So running nose, high-grade temperature, treated with antibiotics. Again, the usage of antibiotics in our part of the world is much, much more liberal or you can say uh, 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 not a methodology of counting the number of times the patient is given antibiotic. While in the Western part, they will count how many times the patient require antibiotic because the use of antibiotic is very stringent. So that's why those kind of criteria have been removed from the IAP definition as compared to the Western definition. One more question is how the uh, increased flow uh, results in pulmonary infections like recurrent infections. Sir, uh, increase the left to right shunt will uh, produce a pulmonary venous hypertension, which uh, will lead to uh, raised mucus secretion and prairie bronchial edema. It is, will also lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension. So enlarge the MPA and RPA will compress the bronchus. And also because of uh, large left to right shunt, uh, child is uh, having a failure to thrive and malnourish. So all these things together will end up in a recurrent uh, respiratory infections. So some of the other thing that you have to say, there is a recent answer, but uh, do they have PBS? Like your first statement was that uh, they have PBS. Suppose, for example, you, you must have catheterized some patients, say two years of age, BSD, 
decently high flowing so do they have pvh by by cardiac catheterization standards like uh, sir pvh 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 pulmonary venous hypertension so do they have a pv pulmonary venous pressure of say 18 25 or la pressure is 25 do they have that okay. Generally, generally they don't have. There are studies that have looked at pulmonary venous pressures mm -hmm. in these children, small children with VSDs, and they don't have, seems to have significant amount of PVH at rest. But the hypothesis is that they become symptomatic when they, when the, when they start becoming, when the pulmonary venous pressures may rise with activity. Like that means mostly crying or feeding, the pulmonary venous pressures may rise. That is the mm -hmm. hypothesis for heart failure in them also. And some of the other thing that it causes for recurrent respiratory infection should be. The, there are some uh, uh, studies showing lack of ciliary motions uh, uh, in these uh, congested lungs, like in the, in the increased flow lungs. The I, know, can add to that, I, think. I, know, yeah. I just wanted a basic question. How do you differentiate upper respiratory from lower respiratory? Because very often I have seen students confusing the two because parents tell them, patient, my child had pneumonia and you interpret it as pneumonia. But you, you know that upper respiratory infections are far, far more common than the lower one. And they really are not significant for congenital heart disease. So can you tell me how do you differentiate the two? Uh, I mean, uh, upper respiratory infection, uh, uh, there will be symptoms like uh, sneezing and lacrimation or rhinorrhea. And uh, there won't be uh, auscultation, uh, the palpitations uh, uh, won't be there. And also there is a uh, tachypnea question what we having your tachypnea and uh, intercostal retractions or grunting yeah i think that will be more for the for the for the doctors to see but the your first point that they often have you know running nose which is often an association with upper respiratory that is how the mothers or the parents recognize also uh, fever is usually not that high whereas in yeah. lower respiratory infections fever tends to be higher also, they are mostly manageable at home. They don't require admission. Uh, in fact, they don't require admission. So this is something from the history you can get because parents won't be able to tell you about grunting and, you know, I mean, they may be, but most of them will not be able to tell you. But that is how you need to differentiate. Okay. So can, you give, can, you, can you give us some differentiate diagnosis of which post like? Sir, it can be a VSD, a PDA, then a, a Complete AVCD, then uh, aorta pulmonary window, then. Uh, so how are you saying that? What is what is? Uh, why are you saying in this order, or how are you saying that? Uh, sir, uh, most common general heart disease is uh, sir VSD and PDS. So, so it's by it's by the prevalence at this age group. And and remember one thing, like uh, the other 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 clue that you can get is. Uh, the the diagnosis of uh, uh, by whether it was diagnosed by a cardiologist or a pediatric cardiologist or a pediatrician, so that means most likely it has to be BSD or a PDA. So rarely you find such a good murmur in uh, AP window and all. So if a hole has been diagnosed, it's more likely to be BSD or PDA. What about simple ASD presenting like this? What is the proportion of ASD that present in infancy? Do is there any group of ASD that present in infancy? Uh, can they present? Can an ASD present like this? Sir, if ASD is associated with other uh, disorders like uh, TAPVC and uh, for a primary pulmonary hypertension of newborn, then it may present. Sir. So even otherwise, also a few percentage, a very minuscule percentage of ASD present with heart failure in infancy. You can read about that, right? Yes, sir. Dr. Ajay Mahajan has joined. Sir, good evening. Um, anything else, ma'am? No, I'm good. I think we can go to the examination. Good, good evening. I am uh, always there. So continue. Oh. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. So general examination and vitals. Patient is examined in mother's lab and she is conscious and alert. Temperature is normal by palpation. Pulse rate is 130 per minute. Regular, normal in volume and character. No radio radial or radio femoral delay. And there is no apex point deficit. Our respiratory rate is 48 per minute. Blood pressure is 82 by 58 in upper limbs and 88 by 62 in lower limbs. Saturation is 96% on the room uh, There is no pale of jaundice, cyanosis, clubbing, edema, or lymphadenopathy. And there is no dysmorphic features in face or skeletal system. And no abnormalities of the... Yeah, go on, go on. Sorry, sorry. 
Yeah, one thing is that when you are describing BP in such a small size, it's always better to give what you should give the percentiles. Yes. So because generally you don't get such a small child in your exams, but when you are presenting such a small child, it's better to give the percentiles at the corresponding age. Go on. Yes. So no abnormalities of hairline, neck, back, or spine. So anthropometry. Weight is 4.8 kg is below third percentile. Height is 65 centimeter, third to 25 percentile, and head circumference is 41 centimeter, less than third percentile. So cardiovascular system examination. So infection okay, and Okay, just wait, 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 wait. So general examination, you mentioned a couple of things. Let's go back. So uh so 48 of a respiratory rate is normal or abnormal for this child? Sir, it's abnormal for this child. Sir, around so what the is the expected is respiratory rate in a child of nine months of age? Sir, at the age of eight to nine months, sir, 30 to 40 around, sir. So this is somewhat less than 40. Than okay. What or kind of dysmorphism you're looking at? Why you mentioned huh? specifically facial or skeletal dysmorphism? What are the syndromic associations of a... Uh, uh, a child of nine months presenting with increased pulmonary blood flow, failure to thrive, and certain dysmorphism, either skeletal or facial, that you should be looking out for. Sir, right. Uh, can we, sir, Down syndrome? Uh, okay, good. More so what is the uh, commonest uh, association? Suppose it is Downs. What, what is the expected cardiovascular abnormality that you would expect with increased uh, sir, pulmonary uh, blood flow? It will be AVCD, most common. Maybe can all defect. Okay, AVCD anything AVCD. else? Sir? Any other disorders, skeletal? Uh, sir, uh, then a trisomy uh, 13 and 18, uh, sir, Patau and Edward syndromes. Okay. And uh, then uh, foot abnormalities? Sir? Foot, foot abnormalities. Sir, a rocker bottom foot in, sir. Uh, Very good. Seen in? Sir? Seen in which disorder? Rocker bottom uh, foot? Sir, in Ed Edward syndrome. Uh, and association? Uh, sir, it, uh, sir, it's sir, VSD and uh, and suppose it is cyanotic. A cyanotic rocker rock bottom foot would be top. more likely to be top, sir. Not top, DORV. Oh. Okay, so uh, also symmetry. What is hyperoxia test? Sir, hyper Hyperoxia test. Uh, no, no, this you should know, Molly. Hyperoxia yeah. test you should know to differentiate a cyanotic versus a cyanotic. Okay, of sir, course, I know this. Cyanotic uh, sir, differentiate the causes. A cyanotic. Uh, sir, is given, uh, sir, uh, 100 percent uh, oxygen. Yes. Uh, and uh, if uh, the cause of uh, cyanosis is uh, respiratory, then PO2 will be rising uh, more than 100. And if it, it is uh, cardio. If it's shunt lesion, then it will not rise. PO2 won't rise more than 100, or absolute rise won't right. be more than 30. So it is that's different. More for cyanotic disorders, and that's the hyperoxia test. That's enough. Of course, it's just off the track here. I, I wanted to know when you say SPO2 96%, you must also say which limb. Upper limb, lower limb, otherwise you'll always miss differential yes. sinuses. Yes. So this was my measure in lower limb. Mm. And about this respiratory rate of 48, you know it is high. You said it is high. Then you should yes. also talk about subcostal recession and all that, unless you want to talk about it in respiratory system examination. Okay. Mm -hmm. it Present to them, there wasn't any subcostal uh, retractions or intracostal retractions. Yeah, Do because you know, when you generally examine and you are looking at the vitals, it will be important to know how sick the child is. Yes. This is your exam, but in normal practice, you may have to immediately act if he's very distressed yes. rather than going on to examination and you know, trying to make a diagnosis. So, you need to, when we say vitals, we are also important, it's also important to know if the child is in distress or not, especially in pediatric age group. Okay, go ahead. So cardiovascular system examination. So trachea is in midline. Chest is bilateral symmetrical with increased precordial activity. Apex impulse is seen and felt in left fifth intercostal space, just lateral to uh, mid clavicular line. It is LV type of apex, hyperdynamic and diffusion character. 
that is the palpable P2 present in left second intercostal space. Uh, three is present at left third and four intercostal space in parasternal region. Uh, there is no impulse, scar, sinuses, and dilatory veins at other regions. So, so how do you know it is P2? There is palpable heart sound at the left second intercostal space. So, the most so it's better to say palpable second heart sound. I mean, you can say whether it is first or second, but presumably in the second left intercostal space, it will be the second heart sound. So better mm -hmm. to say S2 because you don't know which one is it unless you've examined him. I mean, I've auscultated him and decided that time. But yes, on yes. palpation, it is just second heart sound. Yes. Ma then is there a left parasternal impulse? No, I'm left uh, parasternal impulse is not there, ma'am. You know, in, a, in an eight month, in a 4.8 kg child, I would be very, very hesitant to make such specific diagnosis. I mean, such so many findings, what you've written, even left parasternal, because the whole of the precordium seems to be hyperdynamic from what you're telling us. It's a very small child, no? Yes, ma'am. So it will be hard to say. I mean, these so-called typical apex, that parasternal impulse and all that will be very hard in a 4.8 kg child. First of all, it will be very hard to make them lie down. Most of the time you are examining them in mother's lap. If the moment you make them lie down, they cry. Yes. Unless you, did you sedate him? No, I'm, uh, a patient was sleeping then. Okay. Was okay. All right. So probably you need not be very exact in a small baby because you are likely to be wrong. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Nobody is going to, you know, nobody is going to really nudge you for that, especially if you have a child of eight months, which well, hopefully you won't get in your, in your exam. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the upper border of liver dullness is in right fifth intercostal space, mid clavicle line, suggestive of situs colitis, and the left heart border corresponds to apex width, and right heart border is subterminal. The left second intercostal space is dull. Okay. So auscultation S1 is uh, normal. S2 is a uh, wide variable speech with a uh, loud P2. And there was no additional sounds. Uh, there was bed four by six long early systolic marker in left or lower sternal border, base third is third and fourth intercostal space, relating to base and apex, arch in quality, and base third with diaphragm at the end of expiration. Uh, there was also a, a grade 2 by 4 mid diastolic murmur at apex, non radiating, rumbling, and without pre systolic accentuation and wasted with well of the telescope at the end expiration. And uh, uh, there was a grade 2 by 6 ejection systolic murmur at pulmonary area, uh, short in nature and crescendo decrescendo, early peaking, medium frequency, and non radiating, based with diaphragm of the telescope at the end expiration. So what is this early systolic murmur? What do you mean by early systolic murmur? Um, uh, the murmur uh, starting uh, after when the murmur was starting uh, in early systole, but was ending before the second heart sound. So it wasn't characterized for holo, holo systolic murmur. So, so can you tell us how long in systole did it last? How much of systole it occupied? Most of the systole was occupied. Most of this why this is not pan systolic. Yeah. Um, as to a second heart sound, it's especially loud P2 was able to differentiate from the murmur. So, possibly it so it wasn't hollow systolic. Yeah, but murmur can be prominent at lower edge and the P2 can be prominent at the upper edge of the sternal border. So, that doesn't make it a early systolic murmur. What is the typical shape of an early systolic murmur? And what is the typical shape of a pan systolic murmur? Uh, sir, pan systolic murmur will be plateau and early systolic murmur will be decrescendo. So is it a decrescendo murmur? Because that is a that is a very important characteristic because it no, will not no, suddenly sir. drop. Suppose if it has to stop, it will it will gradually taper and stop. No, sir, it wasn't a decrescendo. So then it is better to put it like a pan systolic murmur. Because yes. you know, what are the situations in which you get a early systolic murmur? Uh, Sir, uh, either uh, sir, very small VSD, uh, which uh, obliterates with ventricle contraction, or either there is a non restrictive VSD, sir. And uh, there is a uh, uh, ejection systolic murmur can also be. No, what are, what are, what are hmm. other conditions? Uh, we leave alone VSD, what are other situations you get? Early systolic murmur. Uh, sir, in a, a tricuspid uh, regurgitation, 
which type of trigospid regurgitation ah uh, sir low pressure very good what else and uh, and you can have it in acute mr also yes so these are the situations so what is how is it different from an uh, ejection systolic murmur early it, systolic uh, murmur just, uh, starts after the end of the diastole while the ejection systolic murmur uh, there will be some period where there is a isovolumic uh, contraction and after that there will be opening of the stenotic valve so so very good very good so for uh, for everybody to understand so uh, uh, pan systolic murmur and a nearly systolic murmur will start with s1 whereas suppose if there is additional sound the ejection systolic murmur should start with a ejection click mm -hmm. so that the murmur is not there in the isovolumetric contraction phase mm -hmm. that i think everybody should be very clear i think not only that ejection systolic murmur is a diamond shaped murmur diamond shaped it murmur. is it is not a murmur that decays it first goes up and then it goes down whereas an early systolic murmur typically starts its loudest at the beginning and then it decays so there is a difference not I mean, of course gap is very very important but more than that ejection systolic rises and comes down and of course peaking can vary depending upon what disease are we dealing with but it is a diamond shaped murmur so one small point in your description is i think in two of the murmurs the pitch of the murmur is not mentioned the other thing you have written like frequency frequency is something that is measured it's always what you hear is generally the pitch so you can say that it's a medium pitch murmur pitch murmur yes So what about what about the other murmurs? What is the pitch of those murmurs? Sir, uh, mid diastolic murmur was uh, sir low pitch, uh, and uh, ejection systolic murmur at pulmonary area was sir um, is best start with. That you have written as medium pitch, the the pan huh. the pan systolic or the early systolic. Sir. Okay, go on. One of the causes of early systolic murmur you mentioned VST. I think it's typically seen in muscular VSTs, where yes, there is contraction of the muscle, and therefore the VST tends to close towards the end of systole. Also, you have put it as grade four, grade yes, four, sir. which means that there is it like it's really a harsh murmur, uh, suggesting a huge gradient between the LV and RV. Yes. Sir. Okay. Even early systolic murmur you will get in a VSD when you have a pH, because the flow will only happen. in the initial part so that's the one of the other extreme of the vsd as madam clearly mentioned one is small vsd which will close or you have a vsd with ph now you just have a minimal amount of shunt and equalization of pressure no more a pan systolic murmur yeah but but usually that won't be grade 4 if it's a large yeah, that won't be great. because grade 4 makes it really a uh, lot of difference in gradients between Absolutely. the two ventricles it's it's an early systolic all right but it won't be grade 4 yeah okay final diagnosis other respiratory system other systems liver uh, sir liver when was in other system was normal actually i didn't return uh, so liver is uh, not palpable is not, not palpable liver wasn't palpable okay also respiratory system we would like to know if there was a distress subcostal recession any crap respiratory was 44 48 or something 48 48 Go on, go on. So the diagnosis uh, will be sagittal solitus, uh, levocardia, with congenital asynotic heart disease with large left to right shunt and uh, most probably uh, moderately large VST with hyperkinetic pH and in normal sinus rhythm with grade three malnutrition and currently in NOH class three and no evidence of uh, active infective endocarditis. so usually we don't it? use nyh in uh, small children that is meant for little older children we either talk of ross classification yeah, modified ross classification modified ross classification so i don't know why you want to put him in class 3 because you didn't find any evidence of heart failure and uh, at least liver was not palpable there was tachypnea but there was no liver yes so mr there wasn't a uh, distress patient was not looking in distress okay sorry rama you were saying something No, same thing, ma'am. Like it's a modified uh, RAS score should have been used. Yes. What is RAS score? Can you can you elaborate on what is modified RAS uh, class? Ah, uh, sir, uh, the floor classes. Ah, uh, class one is uh, asymptomatic. 
class 2 is a mild uh, dyspnea and uh, diaphoresis uh, with uh, minimal uh, with uh, activity so basically whatever uh, activity in a child is likely to have in the similar kind of classification as compared to nwh is the ras class modified ras class what about ras score ras score it is a uh, uh, distress in a rest uh, with distress tachypnea and diaphoresis at rest no like there is a gradation of uh, heart rate uh, uh, everything has been graded and everything has been given a point and that is generally used in small children when you are doing a trial like when you want to compare the trial because this is very crude like 1 2 3 4 4 but if you want to do a trial in children with heart failure then ras score is used so the where for example 100 to 120 some points are given 120 to 180 some points are given like that like so that is uh, malik this is not ras 4 it is ras score yes okay no do you want a differential diagnosis or do you just want to consider only this diagnosis um uh, also i think it's important to tell us how much pulmonary arterial hypertension are you expecting also you know uh, since you are saying large shunt but vsd is moderate that also you need to explain usually large shunt with no complication will be large vsd otherwise how uh, would you know the size of the vsd i'm a large shunt because the patient is having uh, symptoms of uh, so why not large vsd because my murmur is long and with still okay how much pulmonary arterial hypertension moderate or severe or mild pulmonary hypertension uh, moderate sir. because there is no parasternal heave or a uh, uh, murmur is also long then if uh, so severe hypertension then there will be rvh and uh, then murmur will decrease and shunting will decrease so the patient will have their less symptoms of uh, uh, Means uh, less tachypnea. Uh, means less for the symptoms of failure, and the patient uh, apex is also down and out. Uh, so there is a definite LV dilatation is there. So it will be uh, hypertension. Hypertension will not be severe. No, 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 no. You said you said when you said pulmonary hypertension, hyperkinetic. You use that word. Yes, ma'am. Isn't it? Can yes, can somebody not have severe hyperkinetic pH with cardiomegaly and all features of large flow? Yes, ma'am. Can okay, ever. Wasn't it? You are. Yeah. I think again. I I will probably have to talk about that when I uh, speak uh, on asynodic heart disease. But I think that's a common mistake that a lot of people do. When you say pulmonary arterial hypertension, firstly you have to say hyperkinetic, which you did say, and also mild, moderate, severe. Severe hyperkinetic pH can also give you a huge left to right shunt. Yes. PA PA pressure will go by the size of the VSD. So on one hand, you are saying that because you are hearing a grade four murmur, you don't want to call it a large VSD. You want to call it a moderate VSD. On the and the VSD and the pH is also moderate. Then why the shunt is so much that he's gone into failure? Practically into failure. At least history wise, he's in failure. Yes. So like uh, you say for for benefit of everybody, so you say large left to right shunt. Is it more than two is to one, or is it more than one point five is to one? How do you decide more clinically? More than uh, sorry, two is to one. So how based do you decide on, clinically? Based on, based on, uh, I mean, there is a uh, inside LV dilatation, apex is down and out. There is mid diastolic uh, rumble is also there. So based and, uh, on mid diastolic pal- rumble, primarily on your flow murmur, so to say. Flow murmur. Yes. So suppose yes, if I say three, he has a real flow murmur and cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this this large left to right shunt with moderate VSD doesn't go. Yes. So you 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 see in VSD you can never measure the size of the VSD clinically exam. You can only talk about the shunt flow. How much is the shunt flow? So by cardiomegaly, by failure, by MDM at apex, you know it's a large left to right shunt. Right. So on what basis are you making it a moderate VSD? So on, I'm only on basis of murmur. I just In that case, your shunt also should not have been large. See, mm-hmm. moderate VSD. You know, a lot of people use the word restrictive VSD, non-restrictive VSD, rather than you saying moderate VSD. So, if you mm-hmm. want to use non-restrictive, restrictive VSD is understandable. But if you are saying restricted VSD, because restrictive VSD only will have grade four murmur. Mm-hmm. That is where the problem is. That your murmur is grade four. Now, my question is, can you explain that murmur by some other means? Because it's not fitting with your diagnosis. When Somebody, would, what are the non uh, uh, gradient based or uh, reasons that can increase your intensity or the murmur? You have uh, same size so, of a defect, 
and one patient has a CVMR, not the other doesn't, what might be the additional? Uh, sir, uh, anemia and uh, the tachycardia. Very good. Good. Also, in uh, many a times, we have seen that uh, it's a large shunt, everything is large, but there's some amount of pulmonary stenosis, which is obviously very mild. And if it is very mild, then it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it still allows for large left to right shunt, but it can increase the size, the, the length and the loudness of the murmur. So you could even bring in some amount of infundibular stenosis if you like, of course, with pH. So there is large VSD with mild pH, which is often infundibular in, in a patient of VSD. That can also give you uh, louder murmur. But the VSD has to be large because the patient is in failure. So uh, one more thing is, suppose if this same same findings are there, a PSM is there in second and third space. What will be a differential diagnosis? What will be the, the explanation for that? It's not in the third and fourth space, but it's in the second and third space. The same finding, same things. Everything is same. I think he is disconnected. I think, ma'am. Disconnected. Probably his net yeah, I must think be he an issue. The connection. So if you find a PSM, then yeah. you should think of an outlet VSD. The same findings. If the murmur is higher up and the thrill is higher up, you should think of an outlet VSD. Tech team, can you connect to Dr. Morlik again? Uh, I think he'll join anyway, but tech team, just try to contact him once. Do we have some questions from the students? Students, you can post questions in the chat box. We can address that by the meantime as we proceed ahead with the further presentation by Dr. Morlik. So you find very rare Dr. chances Morlik for a student back. to ask a question from Anita Mamlai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, Morlik, Morlik you need to unmute. Yeah. You're muted. Yeah, yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's so session easy. time out, probably. That's how it got auto disconnected. Okay, he's probably presenting from institute, right? Malik, is that the case? Yes, okay, yeah, go ahead. So, go to your x ray and ECG. So, this is the answer. Actually, the ECG was at the rest, uh, V5 V6 was not taken. So, I have taken the time. Patient was anxious, so this are five six in poor quality ECGs. But uh, so this ECG is uh, uh, suggestive of there is a uh, 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 there is a left axis deviation. <clears throat> then uh, uh, pro prominent R wave in V one and with the left atrial overload, and uh, there is a, a biphasic uh, QRS complex in V three V four, and with uh, there is a prominent R wave in uh, it's a V6 with a uh, uh, small Q in V6. So, uh, suggestive of uh, there is a biventricular uh, uh, overload with a uh, left atrial overload. Which is V6 here or the lowermost? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Unfortunately, it should have been taken at half standardization perhaps because the child is moving. So, we don't know what R wave is in V6 because I don't see much Q wave in V6. You know, normal. with the VSD, you expect good volume overload of the left mm -hmm. ventricle, and we don't see that. In fact, there is a lot of RVH for sure, but not sure about LV volume overload or LVH because you don't have V4, V5, V6 uh, properly taken. Okay, go ahead. So, this is the uh, just one thing what is the PR interval in that? Like, the PR interval is uh, normal, sorry. Go to the prop other one, yeah. Why is it important, Maulik, to know the PR interval? Uh, sir, there is a prolonged PR interval in uh, ABCD. So what are those criteria called as in ABCD, if you can name all three of them? Yeah. Toscano Barbosa criteria, right? So that's how you differentiate between the three. So Toscano Barbosa is counterclockwise depolarization, prolonged PR interval. So what is this called as the mid equiphasic V two V three V four? You said maybe cat's virtual phenomena. Cat's virtual phenomena, right? Yeah, go to X ray. Go to X ray. So this is the chest X ray AP view, uh, well standardized. Uh, there is a, a pulmonary plethora with cardiomegaly. Cytus. With you must cytus come in pediatrics. Yeah. Cytus solidus uh, with LV type of. How do you know cytus? How do you know cytus? Uh, sir, by. Uh, the uh, dome of diaphragm and fundus shadow, sir. Suppose it's not visible or is it visible here? The fundus shadow is sir, somewhat visible. And okay, suppose it is not, then what else do you look at? 
What is Partridge index? Left left bronchus upon right bronchus ratio. Of course, that's how we look at the trachea oblique, oblique and short and long, left versus right. But the ratio of the length of the left mainstream bronchus upon right mainstream bronchus, that's how you look at that ratio, less than one equal to one or more than one. That is called as Partridge index. That's how do you differentiate cytosolitis versus. Uh, what about the aparterial and hyparterial bronchus at the hilum? Will that also help you? It does. When you're in the modern day, when you're doing a CT, so you know aparterial bronchus versus hyparterial bronchus uh, in case of PA branching at the hilum. That also will add. Uh, of course, once you do a CT, you can easily pick up the situs based on the funding gas shadow as well. So. Uh, this is the LV type of uh, uh, apex with cardiomegaly. There is an enlarged pulmonary uh, bay and uh, there is a pulmonary plethora. So, uh, see, two things. One is that I'm not very convinced of LV apex because apex is not down and out. You don't have to commit necessarily if you can't. You can say there's an indeterminate apex or something. Then you said pulmonary bay is prominent. That's an oxymoron. Pulmonary bay is an abnormality. So, you say pulmonary artery segment is prominent. Pulmonary bay you don't normally get. Pulmonary mm -hmm. bay is also abnormal. Bay is a bay. How can that be prominent? Yes. So say pulmonary artery segment is prominent oh, yeah. if you want to say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't think apex is at all LV type. If at all, it's somewhat on the RV side. I would perhaps say indeterminate. Is, uh, below, dipping below diaphragm and there is a... Apex is lifted up actually. Where is the apex? Apex is not that part. See, in an LV apex, you get an obtuse angle of apex with diaphragm. Here, your, your angle is almost right. But that's okay. You don't have to necessarily comment. But say something that you can't. Uh, uh, you can't make out. That's all. Okay. So this is my uh, um, uh, subpostal view. Uh, suggest you of situs solitus, uh, liver by position of the liver, and uh, so the next is there is a parasternal long axis view. Uh, there is a muscular, I mean, a inlet VHD, uh, and this is the flow across the. No, 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 no. Please, please go a little slow. Go back to the first one. So, usually when you start echo, you start with situs yes. systematically. But anyway, what does this. Yeah. So, what does this particular loop show? This is a subcoastal view. Uh, there is an enlargement of the LV and the LA. LV, uh, LV, you are not even seeing fully. Yes, ma'am. But uh, compared to um, in subcoastal view, LV. RV is always compressed. RV is always yeah. compressed. So you never yeah. compare RV with LV in subcoastal view. What yeah. is seen over here is just the intraatrial septum and the dilated yeah. LA, which is tense. That's all you can say. You don't have to necessarily talk of everything in every view. That's why we do multiple views. So the only yes. information here is the intraatrial septum is intact, LA is dilated, and LA is tense because the septum is bulging to the right side. That's all. Okay, go ahead. Next. Uh, Parasternal long axis view. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a defect at the level of the inlet uh, portion of so the view. Do you see inlet VSD in parasternal long axis view? Actually, I'm inlet VHD has not seen in parasternal long axis view, but so uh, let's VHD talk VHD. of this view now. Let's talk of this view then. Why go to inlet VSD? Because you're going to be asked, why are you saying? See, I, you have seen full ECG, your examiner has not seen full ECG, full echo. So we don't know what you saw in other views. You have seen, but we don't know. So tell so us. Just for the sake of others, uh, Molik, uh, uh, what are the views in which different VSDs are seen? So say, for example, inlet VSD, uh, uh, perimembranous VSD, and an outlet VSD. And muscular uh, VSDs. So in a short short axis view, uh, there is um, the uh, inlet VSD will be at the seven o'clock uh, position in the at the level of the mitral valve. And uh, which short axis that, uh, view? Which short axis are view are we talking about? A uh, subcostal or a parasternal view. No, is it at see short axis view can be at apex and it can be at aorta level. You are cutting the heart of mitral valve views. and aortic level. Mitral valve level. Mitral and aorta, you don't get in the same view in short axis. How can yes, you get aorta is over much higher than mitral valve? Uh, at, at the uh, at both the portion, it can be seen. 
no i i, I think uh, that's not right because it is important for people let's rama can we finish this echo and then talk of that yeah yeah yes ma'am yes, ma okay go ahead please so this is long axis view which is showing the vsd all right but to say mm -hmm. it is inlet vsd is incorrect yes so maybe you can say this is there is an upper muscular type of vsd because you are able to see a small knob below the aortic valve yes either it's a subaortic vsd or it's like a sub upper muscular vsd yes. it's not very clear but uh, you can either way if you say both of them we will be okay Yes. I, I think you'll have to say that I would like to see other views because in the exam other you'll views. be shown those views and then you can comment. The one thing that you should comment over here is there is no AR because always yes. with VSD we talk of aortic regurgitation. Aortic. So there is no AI or AR. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Next. This is the gradient. Uh, maximum gradient is uh, 14 only. Uh, your your uh, pointer is not at all at the right place. It's somewhere in the air. Anyway, th there's hardly any gradient. See, you must understand that when the flow happens, there will be some velocity, some velocity. It will not be zero because the flow is happening left to right. So mm -hmm. to say it is 14 doesn't necessarily mean that it is there. It is possible that with such a large VSD, you are not having any gradient at all. Mm -hmm. It's a flow. Flow has to happen left to right. So some velocities will come. But look at the velocity that you've taken. They're not purely systolic. They're almost continuous. So obviously, it has not been taken. And look at the sample volume. It's an LV. What velocity you have to get into the RV? Yeah. So I mean, it is a continuous wave Doppler. So it will. Yeah, continuous wave Doppler. So, so why do you have a sample volume in continuous wave Doppler? You shouldn't have it, no. It just should be just yeah. a line. But you have a sample volume in continuous wave Doppler also. Unfortunately, why? Hey, nice, man. Can you see the sample volume? Yes, ma'am. So why why do you have it? So continuous wave is continuous wave, all right, but it picks up the signal best at that level. Yes. Okay, go ahead. This is from uh, short axis view at the aortic level, and uh, it flow across. Uh, so this is a, a peri membranous type of uh, VSD from this view. So which, which what? Uh, this is more at a nine o'clock position. Yes, ma'am. So there's nothing mm -hmm. like a seven o'clock position for an inlet VSD in this view. Mm -hmm. This is only either nine o'clock or eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock. This differentiates perimembranous from outlet VSD. And okay. this is for everybody to realize that in short X at the level of aorta, if you have it near the tricuspid valve, which is more like a nine o'clock position, it is likely to be a perimembranous VSD. If you have it at between eleven and one o'clock position, then it is likely to be outlet VST. Outlet. This view is not meant for inlet VST. Mm -hmm. Not nor is it meant for muscular VSTs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, short axis you had uh Michael. I thought the Doppler was not recorded in Okay. LV seems dilated, volume yeah. overloaded. Okay. This is your four chamber, four chamber view. view. Not strictly because you're getting a little bit of aorta. So you're not seeing trichal, you're not seeing mitral valve at all in this view. In typical four chamber, you should be able to see mitral valve also. Mitral. Just talk about the VST in that particular view only. Yeah. Uh, uh, VST in. Uh... It's, uh, in four chamber view, uh, that part of the septum uh, is uh, formed by um, inlet. So that can. No, when you're it. not seeing mitral valve help, how can we talk about inlet? Inlet mm -hmm. part of the heart is a posterior most part of the heart because the atria are lying posteriorly. Mm -hmm. So you have to have both the AV valves to say that it's an inlet VST. If you don't mm -hmm. see mitral valve, then you can't say inlet VST. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, in, in the left side, you are actually seeing the appendage, you are seeing the. It's a very really an anterior tilt where you're not seeing right. the metal valve, you're seeing the aortic valve. It's a yes. basically an anterior tilt to profile the VSD, they have done it. Yes. So is it left to right or right to left? Because it is blue. Uh, I mean, it is left to right only, but because the object direction it is showing like this. And it is very indirect, the uh, board is there also. There is so why is it blue if it is left to right? Because, yeah, uh, because of. Uh, I mean, because of the view, the direction of the jet is uh, in uh, 
patient data it is going away from the probe but uh, yes yes but it is, you are absolutely right it is left to right i think this is another important point that many of the residents make it right to left because it is blue so you must see how the jet is going and uh, molik has rightly said because jet is going away from the transducer it will be blue although it is going from left ventricle to right ventricle so it is a left to right shunt of course very low velocity and the vsd size whatever you see is huge do you have this view or any other view four chamber like without color yes ma'am yeah without color yeah so you can see the large vsd you know what you see on the tip of the interventricular septum where the vsd size is called t artifact you have a little bit of thickening there yes at the tip of the ivs so that is a real defect because it is uh, it means that there is a large vsd so this vsd is really quite large i don't know it's perhaps subaortic primarily from what we can make out it may be extending to upper muscular septum because it is quite large i'm not sure if it is extending to inlet because i don't see the inlet part of the heart yes. so how okay. do you size a vsd when it comes to an echo in a child sir uh, it is a size by the maximum orifice of vsd versus uh, uh, length means aorta so it is if a uh, uh less than uh to one third to um between one third to two third and more than two third of the size of aorta then it is mild means a small moderate and large so i i find the child is maybe i am saying the child is inoperable so what are the things that uh, that in your echo say that child will be operable whether it is hyperkinetic uh, ph or it's because of a really a reversal of shunt because you are finding some bidirectional kind of shunting like no sir uh, shunt is uh, clear left to right only and there is a uh, no means uh, enlarge uh, left atrium left ventricle if uh, shunt was from right to left then uh, there will be right ventricle right atrium enlargement and uh, lv so, so right. ideally you should get a you should get a volumes of the the dimensions of left uh, lv and you should have a z scores yes, what are z scores it is uh, compared to uh, means uh, standard uh, means, uh, if it is so suppose you say you say, you say lv is plus 2 z score that means what if lv is plus 2 z score sir, means what more than 2 is normal sir more than 2 is three. normal or up to 2 is normal uh, what does what does it mean to you what does what does z score mean to you plus 2 z score what does that mean to you no it is a normal z score no no what is normal how do you derive normal It's a uh, if it is a uh, zero to two, then it will be it's a uh, low and um, less and if it a uh, one to two, it will be uh, less less and less than one, it will be severely. Is that right? Zero is normal. No ma'am. Plus one is normal. Plus two is normal. What is minus one? Minus two Z. Have you heard of minus also in yes, Z? So if zero is not normal, then what is minus one? What is minus two? So you don't know. Anyway, I think that's okay. You being uh, you know studying adult cardiology, I suppose it's okay. But it's important for you to understand that these Z scores are nothing but they derive from the population. These are normal, no? Like you have blood pressures for children, mm -hmm. percentiles. It's like that only. So zero is actually the mean or the you know the most normal for that particular age or that particular weight or a body surface area depending upon which parameter you are trying to see most of them are on weight but you can have those on bsa also so plus 1 means more than normal but still perhaps within the normal limits minus 1 also may mean that anything more than plus 2 means lv is really volume overload even plus 2 is volume overloaded but we generally don't worry much about it if it is plus more than plus 2 we say yes lv is volume overloaded similarly if it is minus 2 then your lv is actually small smaller mm -hmm. than normal so so 95% of this suppose if it is between minus 2 and plus 2 95% of the children is likely of that age will be falling in that range minus 2 to plus 2 that is the standard deviation so zero means yeah. the mean one sd when you add you get z1 and when you add two standard deviation on the left side on the right side depending subtracting or adding that's what minus 2 and plus 2 would of z z is nothing of the the p ka ulta so p when you inverse one upon p is what you get z that's simple statistical term for the same age body surface area 
Ma'am, some there are some questions for uh, uh, in the chat box as well because they are on echo. Can we take them right now? Okay. So one is uh, uh, inlet VSD in the sub cost review. You know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't like to comment on inlet VSD in sub cost review because it is a VSD which is seen when mitral valve and tricuspid valve are both seen in four chamber view. So you may be able to see it in sub cost review, but you should make sure that you are able to see the inlet part of the septum, which is the part which is seen when your most posterior part of the heart is being uh, imaged. That means your mitral valve and tricuspid valve is being seen. So ideally, it will be in a uh, uh, four chamber view. And I think uh, subcostal may or may not show. The other is primary pulmonary hypertension. How to describe in clinical examination? Can it be the reason for grade four murmur? No. Pulmonary arterial hypertension does not give you anything more than grade 2 murmur, whether it is primary or not primary. Even Eisenmenger syndrome patients will not have murmur more than grade 2. There is no turbulence. It is only the dilated pulmonary artery which produces this uh, little bit of turbulence and produces murmur. How to quantify pH clinically by the, by the loudness of P2 as compared to A2? If it is equal to A2, it is definitely mild. It is definitely pH. It could be mild, but if it is much louder, it can be severe. And also by the degree of right ventricular hypertrophy on left parasternal heave. If you have a good left parasternal heave for in, and there is no other reason for it, then it could be PAH. Of course, remember, PS can also give you left parasternal heave and RV hypertrophy. Um, there is one more. How to know single as two sound is A2 or P2? No, you will have to go by what company it keeps. Nobody can tell you this is A2 or P2. You'll have to go by the uh, corresponding findings that are present. It may be A2, it may be P2, it may be a summation of A2 and P2. Okay, let's go further. This is some supraspinal view and aortic level local, not turbulence in aortic. What do you want to do for the child? Um, because the child is uh, having a failure to thrive and uh, uh, symptoms of the uh, volume overload. Uh, so the and the age of uh, uh, around uh, eight to nine months. So patient should be operated for VSD surgical disposal. Suppose if this child had no failure to thrive, what will you do? Then we will. Uh, uh, sir, uh, would, no uh, symptom. Uh, asymptomatic child. Sir, VHD is already non-restrictive and large. So at the age of one year, a patient should be operated. So it, it should will be operated be... after any way, around two months of age, any time you should operate a large VSD with severe pH. Would you be more worried if he was asymptomatic or less worried? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, more worried because uh, with the development of the pulmonary uh, uh, vaso, uh, means vascular changes, so there will be decrease in left to right shunt and the symptom will be improved. The patient's congestion symptom will improve, failure to thrive will improve. A recurrent atrial will also uh, go away. Absolutely. So I think you are, you are, per, yeah, you are right. Actually, the patient is going to a Tizen Menger. Yes, I think that is very, very important for people to know because although a nine-month-old is unlikely to go to Tizen Menger, but in Down syndrome, sometimes we see the patients are growing well at eight months, nine months, but they have a large VST. And those are the patients who develop much earlier pulmonary vascular disease. So a patient with failure is a better patient than a patient without failure. So. Uh, anything else? Are there more questions? I think uh, we can have, uh, uh, we can thank Dr. Maulik for a wonderful presentation. You did very well. Dr. Ramakrishnan, your comments? Uh, I think he really, that? really did very well for an adult uh, cardiology resident. So I think very good job done. Thank so you. you have most of the concepts clear. Well done. Ma'am? Yes, absolutely. I think for a second year PG, he's, and that to an eight month old child, I, I would give him good marks because it's not easy to examine small children and it's not easy to, you know, uh, think about these diseases because you don't really see them much in practice. But it is good to know that you all are studying about congenital heart disease and seeing patients of congenital heart disease in childhood, which is, I think, important because still many of these patients will come to cardiologists for the first time and only later go to pediatric cardiologist. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Malik, for presenting. You did really well. And now for uh, the special talk that we have, Dr. Nita Saxena, ma'am, to enlighten our students uh, about approach to a child of asynotic control of heart disease. Over okay, let me see if I can share my screen. There was yeah, one more question. Uh, Z-score yeah, is also applicable for the size of pulmonary artery. 
Yes, if you see the website where all these scores are written, they are present for every part of the heart, including pulmonary artery, aorta. Even aorta also, they, you can get it for ascending aorta and uh, uh, other parts of aotas as well. So this is something that uh, you will get. Uh, there is a and website. also, I believe, ma'am, you were part of the writing committee to define PCSI uh, Z values for Indian children, which is different from the Western counterparts because Indian children are much smaller compared to the Caucasian counterparts. So just copying the values from the West may not actually hold true for Indian counterparts. I, uh, I'm, I'm, me, uh, no, I am not really part of that. I think it's Dr. Gokru's group from Jer uh, Jepur, uh, from from uh, Ajmer, Rajasthan. Who okay. wrote that? But we are still following uh, because our B. It is related to the body weight and BSA. So I think it's very much valid for us also. And uh, Dr. Rama can perhaps post the name of the website in the in the chat box, which I believe all of us must have it in our mobiles because very very handy. Whenever I'm seeing a child with a moderate VSD where I'm not sure whether to operate or not to operate, I just put his weight and height and get the values. If it is still under minus under plus two, I would wait. Okay, so I, should I start, yeah. Doctor uh, yeah, Sharma? Yeah, please, please. Okay, please, okay. So I think many of these things have been covered, but I will still try and uh, uh, talk about things that we've not been able to cover. So this is just the introduction introduction slide where we say that in older children, sometimes you are not sure whether it is rheumatic heart disease or congenital heart disease. But generally, if the murmur is parasternal, then CHT is likely. Of course, in small children, it's not an issue. If there is a murmur, it has to be congenital heart disease in all probability. And of course, we always look for the syndrome. Now, but then comes the question whether it is which CHT is it? This is the conventional classification, acyanotic and cyanotic. And I think we, we all know about it. This is what we have focused today. And again, like for any other disease, history examination, but in congenital heart disease, excellent ECG can give a lot and lot of insight into the diagnosis. And I would suggest that everybody should first go systematically like this, only then go for an echocardiography. In the history, he, Dr. Mollick already talked about feeding difficulties, failure to thrive, tachypnea, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the features suggestive of congestive heart failure, especially when we talk of an infant. Sometimes in older children also, if you talk to the family, to the mother, they can give you history of heart failure during infancy also at times, if they remember it. Then on examination, dysmorphism, any syndrome, Down syndrome or something, then how is the physical development? All pulses must be palpated. Blood pressure, something that we often forget. Dr. Malik did it, in, but in the exam, we do it, but we usually don't uh, do it in our routine practice. And I think as per uh, European and American Society of Pediatrics, it is said that blood pressure must be taken from two years onwards, according to European and three years onwards, according to American society. So at least from that age onwards, blood pressure in one arm must be uh, done. And of course, all painful pulses should be palpated. In children, we don't talk of much of JVP. We go by hepato and edema. We go by hepatomegaly, tachycardia, tachypnea as features of heart failure. And of course, we always check for the saturation. And in the examination of the heart, precordium, we already talked about all these things. And uh, in the precordial examination, we talk about previous sternotomy or previous thoracotomy because a lot of patients are coming to us, especially when you have older children, adults who've, who've had some surgery in the past. I think as cardiologists, we need to be aware which surgeries are done from which scar, whether it is enterolateral thoracotomy or amid sternotomy and all that. And of course, thrill, apex, beat, heart sounds, etc. S2 is very, very important and murmurs. Again, one other point I would like to highlight is that we should also not forget to examine over the back in all children or adults where you are suspecting congenital heart disease. So a better way to uh, to approach these patients is to see whether how they are presenting, whether they're presenting with heart failure or they're presenting with just a murmur picked up in school or in you know when they're going for some uh, admission into a university or going for some job or the mode of presentation is palpitation. Rarely in congenital heart disease, you may have presentation with chest pain or syncope. If it is heart failure, then it is more like a large VSD, like the typical case we had today or AVSD. Severe well, obstructive lesions where ventricular function has developed can also present in heart failure. And of course, infants with severe coarctation can also present with heart failure. And then we have mitral regurgitation, etc. and aortic regurgitation, which can also be congenital and produce with and present with heart failure. Usually isolated murmur in acyanotic heart disease is relatively benign, unlike cyanotic. And here small shunts like small VSDs, small PDAs, or even a large ASD can present with just murmurs. The palpitation would indicate, again, volume overloading of the ventricle like shunt lesions. These are exertional palpitations, but if there is episodic palpitation, we have to think of arrhythmia. 
chest pain and syncope are features of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension generally not associated with the shunt unless patient has gone into eisenmenger so severe ph with a large vz like the child we had generally will not present with chest pain or syncope and of course severe aortic stenosis can also present in the same way but what is important or i would say most important when we are approaching a patient is to know what is the age of the patient because all these of all these diagnoses that i have given would vary depending upon what is the age of the patient so if you are dealing with let's say infants or even smaller children yes large vsd large pda severe valvular lesion severe coarctation could be cause of heart failure but if you are dealing with an older child or adult then generally large shunts are already gone they have either eisenmenger eyes or they become smaller in the child is and the patient is practically not in heart failure but yes severe obstructive lesions with ventricular dysfunction can go into heart failure at any age and so are regurgitant lesions like mr and ar one more uh, point that we should talk about at in older child adult is about hypertension because that is often misdiagnosed because we don't palpate femoris nor we nor do we take blood pressure in these patients one uh, one additional group that is adding on to this presentation is that patient has had a post uh, has had an intervention or some surgery in the past and this is a growing population especially you all are going to see is much more because these patients are 10 12 15 18 years old and they tend to see adult cardiologist first so if we talk of adults and older children that these are the usual asynodic that you are going to see asd is probably the commonest defect at uh, beyond 18 years of age then you may have some small vsd small pdas or moderate vsd moderate pdas who have not eisenmengerized coarctation again presenting a simple hypertension in a young patient and some amount of obstructive lesions like as and ps abstin anomaly can also be asynodic and can present with uh, sur good survival ap window is a very rare disease but usually they would eisenmengerize in uh, at the level of adults one additional group that i just mentioned will be post op asd post op vsd post op pda post coact intervention and of course prosthetic valves and another group that has been increasingly seen is that of tetralogy of fallows who present with pulmonary regurgitation primarily and have required a regular follow up and post single ventricle repair which is fontan surgery so this is an expanding population that you all and we all are going to see more and more in future we did talk of uh, syndromic association and we it is just to tell you that some of these syndromes can give you a clue as to what diagnosis are you dealing with for example downs Yes, fifty percent of Downs will have AVSD, but remember, even a simple large VSD is also a known association with Down syndrome. Rubella with PDA, uh, Williams syndrome is with supravalvular aortic stenosis and peripheral PA. So, if you have a patient with Williams syndrome who has a systolic murmur, think about supravalvular aortic stenosis. Nunans with pulmonary stenosis, Holt or Am with atrial septal defect, Turners with coarctation, and so on. So, these are very typical syndromes where you can make a diagnosis. You are likely to be correct more than fifty percent of the times if you remember. Uh, what diseases are associated now coming to the clinical assessment whether it is an obstructive lesion or a left to right shunt i think all of us know that so called recurrent respiratory infections failure to thrive hyperdynamic precordium heart failure they all indicate left to right shunt because it is high pulmonary blood flow in these patients and of course cardiomegaly and increased pulmonary blood flow on a x ray chest but those with smaller shunts like small vsd or even moderate vsd in pda and those with even a large asd are likely to be asymptomatic i'm sure we've all seen large asds presenting with some non specific symptoms like chest pain or some palpitations and not really with failure or with uh, failure to thrive and heart failure features so this is x ray chest of an atrial septal defect where you can to some extent make out that's an rv contour apex and the right atrium is dilated as against vst where it tends to be an lv apex and the left atrium is dilated not right atrium pda can to some extent be suspected from x ray chest it is almost like a vst but what you see is a bit of prominent aorta so here the ascending aorta and the arch of the aorta may be little prominent and sometimes between the aorta and the pulmonary artery you can see a fullness which is actually the duct that you are seeing of course these ducts are tend to be bigger and not very small but you can get a clue but i think overall you can say there is cardiomegaly and pulmonary plethora ecg very very important i would say it can tell you like this particular patient has biventricular hypertrophy very clearly seen here and also good q waves in v5 v6 i think these are very very important because something that looks like a vsd i saw the other day patient was saturating at 92% 8 month old but the ecg lacked this kind of lv forces it had primarily i mean it it had lv forces but it did not have so much of lv volume overload so then it turned out to be subvalvular aortic stenosis 
So these Q waves are important because they tell you about volume overload, not just pressure overload, but volume overload. And in infants, you tend to see biventricular hypertrophy. Of course, if these children are not operated, then you'll see more and more right ventricular hypertrophy. But here you can see it is cat's weckel phenomena, and this is very typical of a large VST. <clears throat> of course, ECG can be normal and the shunts are small. This is again, all of us are familiar with this classical ECG of AST, right axis deviation, incomplete right bundle branch block, sometimes the PR interval may also be full. And this tells us about secundum ASD. If in an ASD patient, your, your, your QRS axis is going left, like here, then we know that we may be dealing with the primum ASD or part of atrial ventricular septal defect. This is a, quite a classical ECG of a sinus venosis ASD, where you get these negative P waves in inferior leads and notched R wave in lead 2 AVF. I think this is, all of you must have seen it in books also, very classical of uh, sinus venosis ASD. So a finding of ASD clinically, but ECG looking like this, think about sinus venosis ASD. Of course, you can always confirm it by echocardiography. Now in post tricuspid left to right shunt, the next question that was asked from uh, Mollick also is about whether it is more than two is to one, what is the quantum of left to right shunt? Cardiomegaly, yes, very large heart, heart failure in a child, especially in an infant would suggest large shunt or associated lesions. Second heart sound split being white variable like you had in your patient or as the PVR increases, the split tends to narrow. Presence of shunt murmurs like mid diastolic murmur at the apex, which again will disappear if pulmonary vascular resistance increases presence of, uh, sorry, presence of flow murmurs and presence of shunt murmurs both and x-ray showing cardiomegaly plethora, ECG showing left ventricular volume overload. When we talk of pulmonary arterial hypertension with shunt lesion, this is a concept that I was trying to uh, describe when we were discussing pulmonary artery hypertension. All these large post tricuspid left to right shunts would go through these phases. Left to right large shunt, increased pulmonary blood flow, and over a period of time, the PVR tends to increase because of the endothelial dysfunction and smooth muscle cell proliferation. Now, remember, these phases are still reversible, and therefore, this pulmonary artery hypertension is likely to be hyperkinetic with the PVR. If you calculate, it will be normal or near normal. On the other hand, when the PVR starts rising, then they become inoperable, and that is where we talk of Eisenmenger syndrome, and PVR is going to be high. Of course, there will be a, you know, like a gray zone somewhere here where you would have to assess them for operability by various means, but hyperkinetic pH patients will always be operable because they are not developed significant pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. And infants generally are hyperkinetic pH, however big the shunt may be. And this is what I'm trying to show that pulmonary vascular disease tends to start developing in a large aphanotic patient at two to four years of age. And that is why we generally say get them operated before one year or so preferably even at six months or three months before the changes happen. And in ASD, perhaps it never happens or it happens much later in life. But the VSDs, PDA, AVSD, they tend to develop pulmonary vascular disease early. But anybody who is coming less than one year with a VSD, you should think that this patient is always operable and therefore should be considered as hyperkinetic pulmonary artery hypertension. Here are the x-rays from two patients, one infant showing cardiomegaly, plethora, PVRA is likely to be normal. Of course, we don't catheterize them, but this is what it is going to be in case you decide to catheterize. And this is an adult with a PDA with severe pulmonary artery hypertension. And this is a patient where PVRA is increased. So pulmonary, the cardiomegaly has gone away. Plethora has become central. You don't see much vascularity in the periphery. And of course, very prominent pulmonary artery segment is seen here. Now, just brief about obstructive lesions, ASPS. These are generally asymptomatic. Symptoms usually occur only when the obstruction has become severe. So you may have a loud murmur, but patient may just come in because of the murmur has been discovered at some point in time. Sometimes chest pain you may get in patients with severe aort aortic stenosis. The hallmark is ejection systolic murmur, which is a diamond-shaped murmur. The earlier the peaking, the severer the stenosis. And to say that it is valvular, you have to hear an ejection click. Fortunately, in children, we don't get calcified aortic valve, so ejection click is almost always there to suspect when you suspect valvular aortic stenosis. There will be corresponding ventricular hypertrophy and X-ray chest showing post nodal dilatation. So to differentiate, murmur is going to be more uh, onto the right side in case of AS or second aortic space, which is third left intercostal space, whereas in valvular PS is going to be more at second left intercostal space. Ejection click we all know is constant in valvular AS. It is con in constant PS. What is important to understand is that in aortic stenosis, A2 remains normal. 
in intensity, whereas in pulmonary stenosis, P2 becomes soft. So the split may be narrow or may be reversed, but A2's intensity will stay quite normal in patients or especially in children where the calcification does not happen as normal. And of course, there'll be apex beat, which can differentiate. So this is post nodding dilatation of aorta in a bicuspid aortic valve. Remember, patients of bicuspid aortic valve with AS can also have so-called aortopathy, and therefore they may show a lot of aortic dilatation, which may not be uh, you know, going in line with the degree of obstruction. So obstruction is one, but aortopathy can also produce a lot of aortic dilatation of ascending aorta. And of course, here you will have post nodal dilatation of pulmonary artery segment with a prominent left pulmonary artery as well. The post nodal dilatation goes more towards LPA compared to RPA. Pulmonary blood flow in PS patients also, please don't say it is reduced because it tends to remain normal unless the right ventricle has failed or there is an AST which is shunting right to left. So in pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary blood flow is normal. Cardiomegaly in obstructive lesion is really a sinister finding and it always suggests ventricular dysfunction. This is a patient of pulmonary stenosis with RV dysfunction and neonate actually. And this is a relatively older patient with LV dysfunction because of severe aortic stenosis. So these patients, so any obstructive lesion with cardiomegaly is something you need to take very seriously. And obviously urgent intervention for balloon dilatation is to be done, whatever gradient you are getting. So severe AS patient may have a gradient of just 30 because the LV has become so poor, it is unable to generate that gradient, but you still will go ahead and dilate because you know that this is severe aortic stenosis. ECG is expected to be uh, LVH and RVH, but remember in aortic stenosis, again, ECG can be normal. So aortic stenosis is notorious in that clinical examination, uh, X-ray and ECG may not give you much clue about the severity and very often it is the early peaking of the Marvin and the splitting of the second heart sound which will give you a clue in addition to of course a slow rising pulse that you may be able to palpate in the uh, artery. Coarctation of aorta as I said often missed because blood pressure is not recorded, femorals are not palpated. But in neonate, there's another reason why it may be missed because there's a large PDA. So often these neonates who are born with coarctation with, with the large PDA may not may not be detected to have coarctation, but the moment their PDA closes, sometimes happens at home once they are discharged, then they may present with heart failure and tight coarctation. And of course, they can be very, very sick when they come. You start prostaglandins on them and keep the PDA open to make them better. X-ray chest will show notching of the ribs, little in older age group, usually beyond two to three years of life, not before that. But in Adults usually coarctation will get notching of the uh, x-ray will show notching of the ribs if one is looking for it. So you have to really make an effort to look for notching of the ribs. And similarly, you will have collateral murmurs over the back in these patients with tight coarctation. These are some of the uncommon causes, AP window. Again, I think something that we often miss is left ventricular inflow obstruction, which may be cortri atriatum or supramitral ring. I think these are important causes because they have very good outcome after surgery, whether it is RP arising from aorta, some people like to call it hemitruncus, or there is uh, pulmonary venous obstruction. These are the other causes of pulmonary hypertension. I have, I'm bringing this out because very often you, if you don't look for these causes, you will miss them. And we've had patients where children have been diagnosed as having idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, just because one did not make enough, enough effort to look for these uh, so-called subtle features on the echo. So one has to be really on the lookout before making a diagnosis of so-called idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension, which in a child I would say is extremely rare. Final diagnostic test, yes, it is echocardiography, but clinical examination must be done and the echocardiographer must be provided with clinical data before saying that this is, uh, this is the, before going, sending the patient for uh, uh, for echocardiography. I'll just give you two examples. One is an adult, 18-year-old female, presenting with NYHA, has been known to have a diagnosis of ASD for many years. Clinical findings are of, also of ASD, but JVP is elevated and liver is 5 centimeter below costal margin, which in, to my mind is very unusual in an 18-year-old presenting with ASD. So these are the patients where you have to look for causes of heart failure, whether there's Atrial fibrillation, which sometimes happens in 30, 40 years, that stable patient of ASD suddenly deteriorates because the patient has gone into atrial fibrillation, or it could be lotem uh, syndrome because of associated mitosis, or it could be left ventricular inflow obstructions, pulmonary, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, and, and so on. So the message is that if there is an ASD patient with heart failure, please look further 
and look for one of these causes of heart failure in which you will find. This is a relatively young patient, 11 month old, presented to us with dilated left ventricle, very poor ejection fraction, diagnosed as dilated cardiomyopathy. You can see a huge heart and a poorly contracting left ventricle. Medical follow-up, but an ECG will tell you that this child has anomalous coronary abnormality because if you look at the ECG, there are deep Q waves in one AVL and even in V5, V6 with some STT changes. So this gave us a clue that however echo, whatever echo may show, this child is going to have uh, anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery, which yes, can be missed on echocardiography sometimes. But I think ECG is a clue where you must go ahead if required, even to do an angiogram or a CT angiogram to be very sure that you are not dealing with l -kappa. So this is the checklist for treatable cardiomyopathies especially when we talk of small children, whether it's coarctation, of course, in older in females, it could be Takayasu arthritis, severe aortic stenosis, and so on. Again, don't make a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy unless you've ruled out all these causes. And l doesn't only happen in, in, in infants. It can present even in older uh, patients. And this is one 56-year-old lady who presented with uh, features of l -kappa. She presented with LV dysfunction and mitral regurgitation. So to conclude, a systematic clinical evaluation is necessary before making a provisional diagnosis. X-ray and ECG will be very important to further arrive at a specific diagnosis, which you will get in majority. Echocardiography, yes, will pinpoint the exact effect, provided, provided it is supplemented with clinical data. Otherwise, errors on echocardiography are very, very common. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, ma'am. Fantastic talk as expected. Always, ma'am, is up to the mark and extremely learning session that it was. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for enlightening students on this topic. And we look forward to hear from you on other topics in future as well. So if there are any questions for, uh, for the topic in the chat box other than what madam has already answered? No, sir. There's no questions left. Uh, 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 Professor Dr. Marjan. Uh, Dr. Marjan, sir. Uh, Dr. Ramakrishna. Sir, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I think it was a wonderful talk from ma'am. It's always a great pleasure to listen to ma'am. So I've been very fortunate to work with her and then learn so much from ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. So uh, I thank from bottom of my heart on behalf of me and uh, Dr. Ajay Marjan uh, for this wonderful discussion and session uh, to Professor Dr. Anita Saxena, ma'am, and Professor Dr. Ramakrishnan, a friend of mine. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be having you with us. And it's always an enlightening sessions that we have had. We look forward to have uh, your guidance in future as well. And we look forward to have you all join us next Saturday for another case discussion that the schedule of the same has been shared with all the students who are watching this session. There are multiple platforms, but this session we have kept in a fashion that is what is demanded by our students that a case presentation and then what should have been done extra by an expert faculty like uh, ma'am did today. And that's how we intend to proceed with the remaining six sessions as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishnan, sir. Dr. Ajay Mahan, yeah. sir. Good night and over to Kanu, everyone. Thank you, sir. So first of all, uh, on behalf of MacLeod, I'd like to convey my sincere appreciation to Dr. Maulik for presenting a very nice case and also handling the question very nicely. And my deep gratitude also goes to Anita, ma'am, uh, for having this uh, you know show for this uh, his nice, insightful uh, lecture on this congenital heart disease. We are really in depth to to ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Kamal Sharma, Dr. Ramakrishnan, and Mahajan sir for making this uh, session more interesting and informative. I've, I'm sure students will be uh, largely benefited from today's discussions, and also encourage other students also participate actively to make our endeavor really fulfilled. So, with that positive note, I like to also thanks to all the audience uh, for their you know participation and patience sharing. Thanks a lot. Good night.